I'm going to ask that you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10. The title of the message is The Healing Power of the Gospel. The Healing Power of the Gospel. Last week we looked at the day of Pentecost. That passage led us to the point of reading the first recorded sermon after the Spirit was given and indwelt people and also after the church was birthed. And our text this morning is going to take us through the first miracle recorded after the day of Pentecost, the day where the Spirit was given, indwelt people, and birthed the church. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Hopefully you've made your way there, and I'm going to ask that you you stand as we uh, read God's Word together. Acts chapter 3. We'll look at these 10 verses together. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. And seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk. And entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we ask that as we send under your word preached, that by your spirit you'd be so faithful to conform us into the image of your Son. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word, for the truth of your word, for the life-giving power of your word. And we pray that your church would not be the same because we've gathered, we've opened our Bibles, we've opened our hearts and minds, and we've opened to becoming more like Jesus. And so we ask that by your power you would do that now. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So this morning, you brought into this room an opinion. You actually brought, probably brought several opinions. Uh, but you brought a, an opinion specifically about who you think, who you perceive Jesus Christ to be. And you also brought into this room a, a unique type of suffering. I don't know to what degree, but all of us to a certain degree, if not now, you have in the past and you will in the future, you, you have brought in a certain degree, a certain type, a certain amount of suffering. And, and this happens because of the effects of, of the corruption of sin, because of the fall of the world. And because of that, suffering looks different in, in each of our lives. What is also in this room and what you've brought in is a level of belief a certain type, uh, a certain degree. The level of obedience, the level of Christ conformity, the level of sanctification that each of us has in this room, it, it varies. It it's varies in degrees. Uh, the level of maturity uh, in following Christ. Recounting this healing, walking through this passage, uh, this healing miracle helps us become more like Jesus. And we're going to walk through the miracle and we're going to see how this helps us in multiple ways. But but first, when we come to uh, a miracle, any miracle that we read in Scripture, but even even this miracle, we have to believe in miracles. We have to believe in divine activity. And that's hard to do in, in today's Society. It's hard to do. It's hard to believe in miracles. It's hard to be people of faith. It's hard to say that we believe in something that is outside natural law when we live in such 
uh, what, what claims to be a, a very enlightened society, a scientific, a modern, a sophisticated, a very intelligent society. How can we believe, the world would tell us, how can we believe in a system that is pre-scientific, some would see as superstitious, even belonging to the ancient Middle Age, the unenlightened system. But here's the reality. As Christians, we have to believe. We must believe. We have to have faith, and we have to have faith and belief, in particular, in miracles. Why? Because Christianity is a religion of miracles. Divine intervention in the observed order of human events are a part of the biblical narrative. Believing in Jesus Christ, actually, you have to believe in miracles. God taking on flesh in the form of Jesus of Nazareth, then born of a virgin, which we would say is a, is a top-tier theological issue in, in our belief system, Christianity. He himself performed miracles, exercised demons, gave sight to the blind. By his very voice, awakened the dead, brought them to life. And so you have this miracle uh, here after the day of Pentecost. The, the Holy Spirit has come and has given the language to several different people representing several different countries. Peter has preached a sermon. He has preached it with boldness. They are going in and out of uh, everyday life. But in this particular scenario, this scene, Peter and John are walking up to the temple. And you know they're walking up to the temple with great intent. They're walking up to the temple to make sure that people are very clear on who Christ is, what he has done, and how belief in him can bring saving faith and graft you into the family of God. And it's not just for the Jews, the chosen people of God, but it's also for the Gentiles. So they're going up, walking up to the temple with great intent, with great focus. And you see, they encounter. They encounter this man who has been at the beautiful gate time in, time out. He's made a career. He's made a lifetime out of asking people for alms. And in response, they tell this man, I have no silver, I have no gold, but what I do have. And they begin to point this man to the name, to the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, and then tells this man to rise up and walk. Pulled him up by his hand, and immediately you see the response. He begins to walk, but he begins to do even more than that. He begins to leap, he begins to praise. And because of what they see, people are amazed at what they've observed. They begin to even question it. Wasn't this the guy that's always at the beautiful gate who's now walking and walking with these men, these disciples, these apostles, and giving and praising the God of whom they are preaching about? In particular, the one about Jesus Christ from Nazareth. And Peter, in light of this, steps up and evangelizes as he does. Okay, I have some things to step through. Five points. Take a deep breath. Here we go. First one is already here. This miracle verifies Jesus. As we walk through this miracle, I want, you to, I want you to observe five different things. The first thing we see is that this miracle verifies Jesus. In Acts chapter 3, verse 6, Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. Not just in any particular sequence of events, not in just any particular person, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. From the beginning of time, people have always had to ask the question, is the promised one, is the Messiah, the anointed one, is Jesus Christ divine or not? Is he the son of God or not? Is he the promised Messiah or not? Other religions will tell you that he is a good man. Some will even give you that he is a prophet. But how do we know? How do we know that Jesus Christ means more than just a good man? He's more than just a prophet. He's more than a liar. He's more than a lunatic. How do we know that he indeed is Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord? Jesus Christ is the example of divine activity. He was about divine activity. Now let me set this up because miracles are a hard thing to understand. Miracles can be construed. Miracles can be abused. But let me tell you kind of the foundation of the idea of miracles. And it's really rooted in the God of the universe himself. In his created activity, God established the ideas of miracles. So follow with me. The universe as we know it, contains three things. 
It contains all matter, all space, and all time. And the beginning of the physical universe is the beginning of those three things. Matter, space, and time. And because these three things exist, it means that the cause of the universe must have caused these three things. And because he caused these three things, it means that the creator of the universe must be independent of all of these things. You see where this is going? So because space, matter, and time exist, and the creator God created those things, in order to create them, he's got to be independent of them. In fact, it means that this cause of the universe, the God of the universe, must be unchanging. It means he must be unchanging. Why do we know this? We know that gravity exists. Gravity's unchanging. Gravity's 9.8 meters per second. It's forever and always. It's a natural law. It, it, there has to be an unchanging nature, nature to the creator. It also means that the creator of the universe must be always present and eternal. When we think about space, matter, and time, it would even suggest that the cause of the beginning of the universe was a person with a will. And we would say we believe this is God of Scripture. And as expected from Scripture, the structure of the universe was designed with man in mind. All of this was created so that you and I could exist, so that we could interact, we can breathe in, we can breathe out, and we can experience a, a creation that was designed for man. We would say that the purpose of the heavens was to provide a place for man to live, to know God, to glorify Him, even from the beginning. And so natural laws were created with physical con constants in place. The universe was created large enough to support life, to house the lights that God would place in it. And it was just probably a hundred years ago when we as creation could observe what God created. And just probably a hundred years ago, before we got really, really smart, or we think we got really, really smart, where we would look into the sky, we would see the sun, and we would be okay with the answer that God created it, and it's good, and it's good for us. We would be okay with that. But in today's scientific, modern, secular age, there is, there is this ever-ending pursuit to understand and to know exactly how many millions of miles away the sun is and how fast it comes to the earth and the photosynthesis it creates and all that happens. But it's okay. It's, the reminder is it's okay as believers to look up and to know that God created it. He spoke it out of nothing and it became something. This miracle verifies Jesus because we have to be wise about miracles because it means that you have to work hard at figuring out why this world exists and what God wants us to know. We want to, we want to think through those things to know that gravity is there. But more importantly, we have to work hard at believing, at actually having faith despite our education and our brilliance in and of ourselves and our education to know that we, are, uh, we worship a God and a God who performs miracles. This is the first miracle after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. This miracle serves a purpose, and here it is. This miracle lets us know that there is, there's no chance of identity theft. No chance of identity theft. Uh, praise be to God, Aaron and I, we finally closed on our home, and we, we sold it. And it's really hard to believe uh, that that happened. Uh, based on all that we had to do. You know, we lived in that house eight years. We had kids. I mean, we lived in that house. And so we worked hard to get it ready, get on the market and do all those things. But now you know, now you know there's, there's this process where we actually closed in San Diego and we did most of it by uh, signing documents electronically. We just hit e-sign and initialed and signed our document. And we did that. Why? What was the point of the signature? The point of the signature was to verify that I am who I am, and this is my house, and I'm selling it, and I'm selling it for these reasons. Miracles are essentially that, that activity of God, divine activity of God that lets us know, this is my son, these are my followers, this is, this is from me, authored in my mind, 
granted by me. This miracle is divine activity and there's only one identity to, for it to be associated with and that is the God of the universe seen in the Son of Jesus Christ. This miracle verifies that Jesus Christ is who he is. Born of a miracle, exercised miracles, conducted miracles, and today is verified by this fact. God verifies Jesus in everything about him. Also verifying the message of who Jesus Christ is. So the first thing you see is that verifies Jesus. The, sec the second thing this miracle does is it validates the apostles. This is an important thing to remember. Miracles are often associated with the advancement of the kingdom. So we would say that areas of the world that have not experienced a tremendous amount of the, or the outpouring of the Holy Spirit Areas of the world that are hostile to the gospel or maybe have never heard of the gospel are areas that are prone to, to activity that is, that is divine. Activity that is divine. And it's not just to prove the power of the apostles. It's not that. It's to approve of the message that the apostles or the messengers of Jesus Christ are actually saying. That's the point. Look at verse 7. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. God endorses the apostles. And why wouldn't he? Jesus has lived. Jesus performed miracles, has been crucified, experienced death and resurrection to life. He's ascended, promising the Holy Spirit who has awakened sinners to belief in Jesus. He's birthed the church and sent them out to preach about Jesus and testify of his spirit. And so here, this miracle happens so that the followers of Jesus and their message are backed by an eternal God. You'll find over 20 miracles occur in the book of Acts. This miracle in Acts 3 is a healing miracle. And remember, as this is going, God is illumining truths for the apostles to not only to believe, to only believe about who he is, but then he's telling them to preach about these truths, to preach with several things considered. The, the remarkable thing about what they're preaching now is now that they preach, they preach in a language that is understood. That is divine activity in and of itself. This quickly, after the birth of the church, the spirit and dwelling believers, this quickly, the gospel's being heard in a language and it's, it's authorized and verified by the miracle. So they're preaching in language is understood. They're also preaching with the fulfillment of prophecies in mind. They are preaching with the knowledge that Jesus Christ was truly the Son of God. They're preaching the testimony and witness that the Spirit of God is certain and belief in these truths is necessary. So we would say that God divinely steps in and heals this man. The apostles are endorsed. The apostles evangelize. And whatever you think about Jesus, this miracle work proves you should believe this about him and the saving work that continues to happen through faithful preaching and the Spirit's miracle work of breathing spiritual life into dead sinners. This is happening in the birth of the church. It's been the life of the church and it's in the life of the church even now. And this is a re an important reminder for us as we are overwhelmed by a spiritually dead context. This activity has been the rhythm of the church and will always be the rhythm of the church. The third thing we see from this miracle, this miracle reveals God's promise to restore. This miracle reveals God's promise to restore. Look with me to verse eight. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Now I've already said this, but Suffering is uh, an unfortunate thing that happens. It's pain, blindness, lameness, suffering, and all of it happens because of the corrupting effect of sin entering into the world. Suffering is difficult. I think everyone would amen that. Suffering is difficult. No one wants suffering. Suffering seems final in its, in its moment. Our bodies suffering, our desires suffering. It's, it's hard as you get older to see a desire of yours or something that you envision to happen come to an end or maybe change course. That's a, that's a difficult aspect, especially in, in the context where we've been told if you just believe it and work hard, it can happen. But we always come to the reality that God is the author and he's the, he, he is the one who, who perfects our faith and authors our faith and, and guides our path. It's, it's hard at times, though, whether, whether it's our desires, whether it's relationships, relationships that come to an end are tough, marriages, unfortunately. Um, 
Marriages experience a tremendous amount of suffering. And all of this is because of sin. But this miracle, this miracle reminds us that, that suffering isn't eternally, it isn't an, an eternal punishment. Uh, and, it's, and it's not eternally permanent. Um, now, it, it, isn't even, it isn't even eliminated with belief in Jesus. You can't just say, I, I, I have faith in Jesus Christ for who he is, the promised one, give your life to him and see that suffering ends. It's, it's going to happen. It happens even when you believe in Jesus. And, and it's, it's difficult. But there is, there's purpose in suffering. And there's also purpose in miracles. And Jesus, as I said, Jesus and the apostles didn't perform miracles just simply as an exercise of power to display power. They performed miracles to remove suffering, to show restoration. They performed miracles in order to show the redemptive reasons and the plan of Jesus Christ. But know this about miracles. Miracles were always associated with faith. Faith that leads to ultimate permanent healing and restoration in Jesus Christ. That's an important part of miracles. They just weren't happened to display power, but when they happened, they were, they were associated and attached to faith. And not just faith in anything, but faith in someone, in Jesus Christ. I remember as a, as a young kid, I was at First Baptist Fayetteville at the time. My dad still serves there. He's been there 27 years. Um, I remember as a young kid watching a lady named Brenda Stout worship. And I had a couple thoughts every time I looked over and saw Brenda Stout worshiping. First, first I was enamored by the fact that though she had experienced such suffering in life, um, bound to a walker, legs barely working. She was so ambitious and eager to actively worship on Sunday morning. It was astounding me. And I look around at people who had, on the surface, had, had able bodies to worship and just, just didn't seem to be connecting. And then one day, God graciously uh, allowed me to think about, and this, this, this is the beauty of what happens when we gather and worship and we sing together and look around to one another. I, I, I know I'm getting to know each, and, each one of your lives. I'm getting to know the suffering that you have, the suffering you experience, even the suffering you're in now. And what does my heart good is when we're singing to see you sing, to know that in your suffering, you're still here, you're still trying. That, that, that helps my faith. I never will forget this, this image of Brenda. She always sat to the left of the congregation. She was always three rows back, the far left. And I, I, I remember I would watch her sing, and she would be singing, trying to hold her hand up in praise, but she couldn't because to let go of her walker meant to fall. And one Sunday morning, I thought, one day, those resurrected legs are going to stand up and be strong as she sings to her king. One day, not now, not now. There's purpose in it now. But one day, one day she will stand. She will sing. Like Brenda, you brought in, you brought in some level of suffering in this room that is keeping you, it's keeping you from full submission to Jesus Christ. And this miracle shows us what is set to come in complete restoration. This miracle shows us that one day we will walk, we will praise for all of eternally and permanently. We will praise perfectly the one who has overcome our sin and has given us hope in the Son of Jesus Christ. Real quickly, let me go through the last two. This miracle shows us the cure for the sickness of sin. This miracle shows us the cure for the sickness of sin. It's obvious when you read this passage, this man suffers physically. He suffered physically for over 40 years. He hasn't walked. He has relied on people to carry him. He hasn't learned a trade. He sits at the beautiful gate. The only thing he can do is beg for alms. That's the only thing he can do is beg. But as bad as the situation is, 
as bad as it is, the pain of physical suffering points to the inward sickness of our souls. That's an important truth to remember for all of us who feel like we've looked in the mirror and feel like we're holding on to some sort of level of good lookingness. I don't know who you are. You've said it to yourself this morning. You look in the mirror and you had, you had some level of reaction. Whatever that reaction is, here's the beauty of Scripture. Whatever your reflection is, a mirror, look to the text this morning and be reminded that whatever suffering that is happening now points us to the inward sickness of our souls. What this lame man was going through at the beautiful gate laying there is bad. But the sin that is in us, that corrupts, that cripples and cuts us from the God of miracles is way, way worse, immeasurably worse. Like permanently separated in death for all eternity worse. Paul says to the Ephesian church, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked full in the, following the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now work and the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, and were by nature not just lame and begging before a gate, but instead were by nature children of wrath. That's where we were. And this man can't even walk to earn the silver and gold he desires. But you know what's worse? Is walking around this world earning silver and gold and spending it as a dead man on dead promises, dead dreams, dead desires, dead pleasures. That's the reality of the situation. Peter's, Peter walks up with something better. That's what this miracle is about, this message, this message that Jesus comes with a cure. It's a cure for a decomposing deadness of our soul. That's what Jesus comes with. The man asks for silver and gold, but his soul is quickened by the gaze of Peter and John. He hears what Peter tells him to do in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He sees the hand of Peter reach down, and he believes that what is being offered is a true cure. The man now believes something about what this follower of Jesus is saying. Everything that comes with the name of Jesus is worth more than the silver and gold. Even greater than physical healing. It's restoration to God. And so it's 40 years of muscle atrophy, no concept of balance, immobile joints, physically frozen. All of that is gone in a moment's notice. Yet he believed that through the name of Jesus of Nazareth, he was reconciled to God. And this was the greatest gift, which is why he just doesn't walk and walk off. But he walks with the messengers. He walks with the hope bearers. He walks with the light, having been lame and in darkness, decomposing both physically and spiritually, now alive, verified by the miracle, walking in faith in Jesus Christ. He's now in the crew. He's now about the commission. He's now about Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This man's laid at the beautiful gate for years. He's seen worshipers come in and out, and now he worships completely changed. That's what this miracle shows us. I didn't read it, but look with me very quickly to verse 16 of this chapter. This is the crux of the miracle. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. Do you? Have you experienced salvation in Christ, forgiveness of sin? Do you currently sit as one who is at peace with God or an enemy with God? Are you a friend or an enemy? Have you experienced the promise of an inheritance that is to come upon your last breath? The gaze, in, the gaze of Peter and John were backed with the name of Jesus. And so I'm going to lump, I'm going to lump this story into the last, the last point. Write this down and then I'll, I'll, conclude the, I'll conclude the sermon. This miracle provides instructions for the mission of the church. This miracle provides instructions for the mission of the church. In verse 4, Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. In 2019, certainly things have changed. We're not talking about John and Peter uh, it's just changed. The climate, the climate of, of where we are has changed. Um, you need to know this about me. I, I, uh, 
So I, I, when I drive on Garnett Avenue and I get towards the hours that Sonic, Sonic promotes as happy hour, I, 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 can't, I can't resist. I just, my truck bike turns right and, and I, I, go, I go into Sonic. Um, I love me some aspartame mixed with a little bit of chemical cherry juice. Um, that's my drink. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but, but, but I'll tell you, this, this and, and, and I'm figuring out, this happens, this didn't happen as much in Charlotte as it happens here. I have my window down, I've ordered my drink, I'm thinking about it, life is good. And then this random guy, who I thought was going to be the, the, the hopper guy, uh, wasn't. It was, it was a, a random guy um, who, who was now approaching me. And uh, he, he had been walking all day, and, and the fair, he had missed the fair, he wanted to be at the fair. I know, I know these lines, right? I mean, I've dealt with dealt with people who have their way of, of getting money. Um, but nevertheless, you know what caught my eye? You know what drew my attention as I thought about it? I'd been studying this passage all week, and I thought, Peter and John, Peter and John, they had a gaze. This man had been here all the time. I don't know this man. He could, he could do it all the time. He could, he, could, he, could be, he could be telling me a lie for all of I know. I don't, I don't know the truth of this man, but what I knew, what I knew was what I had read in Scripture. And that I had, I had a moment here. And, and the way he asked the question and the way he asked for the money, I, I could tell. He was, he was, he was going to at least hear me out on what I had to say. And so I won't give the long and short of the, short, uh, the, long and short of the story, but I, I didn't actually say, you know, here I give you green paper and, you know, a silver coin. I didn't say it like that. I ju- but what I did was to say, listen, brother, there, there's much more here than you just catching a fare with this money. And went on. To sow the seed of the gospel. And I don't know. I don't know if it landed. I don't know if it'll land. But here's the reality. Seeing the kingdom of come in San Diego won't come with us believing. And it may, it may come. But what happens is you find that if we're committed to making disciples, if we're committed to the message of Jesus Christ, and you and I, more and more believers in this area, are willing to do this, then what happens is I introduce the man to Jesus of Nazareth. Then another person comes and talks about Jesus of Nazareth. Then another person comes. And at some point... We do what we do in order for the Spirit to do what He does. We don't know if we'll be heard to a decomposing, decomposing spiritual soul, but what we do know is that we put our gaze on lost people, praying that at one point this Holy Spirit of God will put their gaze on the one we're talking about, Jesus Christ. And lost people come to faith in Christ. That's what this miracle story shows us is that we have to be sensitive to the audience around us, to what is happening. We have to be in tune with the rhythms, those divine moments that we can, we can come alongside. And we may not have divine activity, but you know what is divine truth? The truth about who Jesus is and what following him means for those who are dead. That's the truth. And so my prayer is, as we see and read this sermon and the divine activity of the apostles, that we'll trust in its teaching. And that will be seen in us submitting all of our life to Jesus and using all that we've been given and every word and deed that we put out for San Diego, that prayerfully, dead people will become alive. And that people who are suffering from a soul separated from a holy God will call upon him, come to saving faith faith in Christ. The faith that you and I experience, the faith that you and I have been entrusted to steward to this great city and to the nations and beyond. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for the truth of this message, and we seek to be obedient in carrying out what we have read in this text. We thank you that by your spirit, you indwelt your people, you have called your church, and Lord, help us, help us in our attitude to approach the fellowship that we experience with one another in a way that is humble, in a way that honors others, in a way that loves others, in a way that casts our concerns and our priorities to the side for the sake of others. I pray that we would be a family of faith that does that and that that would be seen in how we interact with the community around us. Lord, you've called us to this city. You've called us to this church for a reason. We have one aim in life, and that is the fame of Jesus, and I pray that that would be our aim. Lord, lead stay-at-home moms. Lead businessmen, businesswomen, Lead those who work for the city, those who work for corporations around the city to be committed to seeing, to putting their gaze on lost souls and then pointing those to the life-giving faith in Jesus Christ that can be found by simply believing in him. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the chance together and to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Week to week, we conclude our sermon with a chance for you to respond 
We're going to sing a song of invitation. That is an invitation for you to respond to the word that you've heard preached. These three men are going to lead us in this invitation song. And my encouragement to you is to respond. You can respond in your pew by asking the Spirit of God to not only illumine the truths that He's shown you, but to lead you to live, to live these truths out. If you do not know Jesus Christ, and for the first time your soul's gaze is beginning to see who Christ is, and you want to talk about it or you have questions about it, I'll be at the front of this at the front here during the song. I would love to have a conversation with you. And even if you don't come forward during the song, there are plenty of brothers and sisters in Christ who know Jesus, who can point you to Jesus. So we'd encourage you to at least have the conversation this morning. Whatever it is, don't leave this room without following Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. His promise is good. Faith in Him is true and life-giving. And that is our prayer. So would you please stand? And as these men lead us, would you respond in a way that honors the Lord this morning?